You going to start the video? Yeah, there we go. It was a devastating car accident. My father died in his seat. My sister, she was 20 when she died in the car accident. All the five of us, two dead, two alive, and me hanging on the balance, because I barely, I mean, I was touch and go for so long. His internal organs weren't working. He couldn't eat. Yeah, the doctors literally kind of intimated to my mom that maybe she just let me go. But she couldn't. I sat beside him and I told him that it you know, looks like you're, you're going to live. Yes, you're going to be paralyzed. And there must be some reason why you're going to live. You're going to probably do something really good. Like I remember when I came back and announced to her that I was going to do, dedicate the rest of my life to yoga. I remember that conversation. She looked at me, went, OK. People who just have their bodies, so you lost part of that. But you were always going to work with your mind. I'm actually doing all the work I'm doing because I want a healthcare system where it didn't take me 12 years to reconnect my mind to my body. I was so shown by the doctors, by everyone involved, what might go wrong with my body, not what was still there and could go right. I'm advocating to get that message to patients. For 40 plus years, all I've really been as just an upper body person, you know, really kind of um, ignoring and not paying too much attention to that lower part of my body. It's hard to even describe um, what it means to feel like you have a whole body. And let's get the connection to the heels again. Find the center. I was boogie boarding with my sister and my sister's boyfriend, and the wave just knocked me down. I immediately couldn't feel anything. I spent about a year and a half bouncing from hospital to hospital. The doctors didn't really give me much hope. If I hadn't met Matt and learned what I have learned from him, I would feel more defined by my injury than defined by the person who I am. Push up through the heel and the ball of the foot of the up leg. Extend up. I know it's working with my students. I've been working with his students for six years. Matt does have an uphill battle in the medical community in convincing them that this is a worthwhile program. But I'm a physician, and I got it, so I know that other people will. With the vets that are returning now, we need to bring it to the next level. We need, we need a mind-body approach to help them heal and recover. What I do with yoga is really ordinary. I just try to be present in my body. This simple thing of just actually listening to my own experience. It's not only changing the life of people with disability, but it's gonna end up being, a, I know, a different way to approach to rehabilitation. The goals of my work and mind-body solutions are to get my story out to as many people as possible. So we're trying to inspire both the patient and their family and the caregiver and the doctors and the nurses and the PTs and the OTs to believe that they can practice in a different way. I absolutely see Matt's work as having an influence on how I view my patients, how I treat my patients, and I think how well they're doing. We're trying to inform them by, by developing curriculum and techniques to help them train differently so they can interact differently. I hope I'm living proof that this does work. I hope people do begin to accept it more. The real frontier is getting the patient more engaged in the healing process. Matt's teachings just kind of give you the ability to connect at a different level than personally than I had ever dreamed possible. Healing is an art. We've gotten lost in thinking it's just a science. If you had told me as a 12-year-old boy that I was going to be a yoga teacher, are you kidding me? I would have said, no way. The unthinkable is possible, and that's part of what I know. So I got to warn you, I'm a yoga teacher. So at any moment, I reserve the right to teach a yoga pose. Any, any moment. So what, do you, what is the level of sensation that Sammy, that quadriplegic, she's a high-level quadriplegic, she can do about this much. 
what sensation within the mind-body relationship do you think she's plugging into or tapping into to feel not defined by her injury but rather than the person she is? How about Kevin? Kevin, he's a paraplegic and don't be confused by the fact that the examples are spinal cord injuries because this applies to everything but but he was a paraplegic. He, was, he fell off a tractor when he was three years old. Broke his back. Um, and never remembers the sensation of walking. Never remembers any of that. He comes to my class. It's probably like three, four years ago. I've been teaching an adaptive yoga class at the Courage Center in Golden Valley, Minnesota for the last um, 12 years. And, and in within one class, he drives home that night and he's weeping. Because no one ever told him that he could feel his whole body again, that it's possible. I'm working for a healthcare system where it doesn't take 40 years, he's 45 now, for Kevin to feel his whole body. As you know, he's, he's, he was injured so young that his legs didn't quite form, didn't grow this at, a, at a normal rate, so he's very much just lived as an upper body. Right? So what, what would that kind of healthcare system look like? That's part of the question that drives my work. And I have a very, very simple premise. If I leave the healthcare system more connected to my body rather than less, we can talk for a long time about what that means, I'm going to take care of it better over time. That's what's going to occur. And if I take care of it better over time, I'm going to end up back in less often, and it's going to save money for somebody. Very simple premise. But what, one of the things that drives the work of my nonprofit, Nine Body Solutions, is how do you teach mind body awareness to me, the end user? What does a healthcare system look like that makes that one of the things that's happening? And I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a little bit. But I'm going to tell you more about my story now. So I was in a car accident. My father and sister were killed in that car accident, as you heard. Um, I did my, after the first week after my injury, I did the next three months here at Mayo. So as a 13-year-old boy, I was here at St. Mary's Hospital. Um, my injuries were quite extensive. I broke my neck at C1. I broke my back at T4, 5, 6. I broke both my wrists, um, filled along with fluid, and sustained an injury to my pancreas that left me unable to eat for a couple of months. I went from 119 pounds to 79 really fast. So I was pretty injured. Um, one of the things that I want to point out um, is that an experience in the hospital, the trauma didn't end at the accident scene. It began. That my experience at Mayo Clinic in all my, all my stays in the hospital throughout my life, they're violent. The corrective violence, you guys saved my life. I will be forever grateful for that. But corrective violence is still violence. It counteracted what happened. My book, Waking, a memoir of trauma and transcendence, the first third of it happens here at Mayo. And the experiences that I had that saved my life, but paradoxically increased my mind-body injury. Now that I'll explain in a little bit. But one thing I want to point out to you is that anyone coming through a hospital experience is getting traumatized. Trauma disconnects the mind from the body. Okay, you know, we talk things like person, the patient comes in and you tell them they got a bad thing and they're, they're like a deer, with, deer in headlights. I'm telling you, they disconnect from their body. And that is an inevitable consequence of them coming through the system. Now, I'm gonna tell you the story of what happened to me. So I, after a couple of months, or in a couple of weeks, I finally get well enough to start, to start thinking about well enough, meaning that I'm not about to die, right? I'm still in ICU. And I start thinking about what my life is going to be like. And I'm being told that I've severed my spinal cord, and that's the, 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 the devastating injury at T4, 5, 6. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm, told, I'm being told that I have no sensation in my whole body, in my, in my body below my point of injury, that basically my mind-body relation below my point of injury is over. And I, I'm a 13-year-old boy, and I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know if that's true. I feel something. I feel it's a tingling or a hum. And, and you know, it's not like other sensation, but it, it's real. I have it. So I tell the doctors about it, and they have big hearts, well-intending hearts. 
And, and, but they're worried. They only see my injury on two axes. They see my injury as physical, and they know the physical injury to my spinal cord is devastating. Right? And they see my other in, the other aspects of my injury as emotional and psychological. So when I start reporting sensation, they actually worry that I'm not going to accept my condition. So they tell me a healing story. They say, well, you know what, those sensations you have are, are phantom feelings. It's analogous to an amputee that's had his or her legs amputated, but they think they still have legs, and they look under the sheets, and they find they don't have legs. That they're mental projections, and they'll fade over time. And that you should let go of that. You should let go of those sensations. They're not real. And in fact, the 13-year-old boy, he objects. He says, wait. I feel them even when I'm not thinking of them. And they go, no, no. And they, a couple of neurology residents come in and they poke me with my, in, my, in my arm. And then they poke me in my foot. And they say, Is it, do you feel the same? And I say, and I'm getting ashamed now and humiliated for thinking that I could have sensation with a severed spinal cord. And they say, I say, no. And they go, see, they're not real. Now, this was a metaphysical argument. It was a bad one. I went to graduate school in philosophy to actually upend that argument, I think. <laughs> right? Just on the basis of sensation being different, does it make one sensation real or not? Well, the point is, is that I stopped listening to input from below my point of injury. That, that I, I just went on. In fact, the vision I got from the rehabilitation model and from my doctors was basically what was left for me to do with my mind-body relationship was to get really strong with my upper body and overcome my paralysis. And this vision is what drove the first 12 years of my life after the accident, that my mind-body relationship below my point of injury, I just figured was over. But the thing is about, about you know, thinking about subtle sensation, it's hard to acknowledge or accept subtle sensation. So when you're thinking about Kevin, who th didn't feel his body, his legs for the first, you know, the 40 years of his life until he came to that class, it's because no one told him to listen at that level, right? Quite frankly, that those subtle sensations we don't, we don't pay attention to. Right now in this room, this whole day has been, your mind-body relationship has been set up for failure. You've been sitting in a dark room. You've been watching slides. Anyone been slumping over? I've been watching people. Some people stay awake this way, right? Some people, I can see their jaws going, and of course, the inevitable new distraction, they pull out their palm pilot. And they start doing stuff, and they're doing all these things because the situation, and it's not a knock against this conference, this is a situation that is only for your mind. You're supposed to be taking in information, and you're not utilizing your body in the dark there. This is a great in technology intervention that I could, have, I could have had a PowerPoint here, right? And you could look at slides and stuff, but the problem is it assaults your mind-body relationship. So everyone, just for a second, notice how you've been sitting. A lot of you are sitting that, that way now. You're, I call this, everyone slouch in their chair for a second. Just kind of slide out, right? Splay your legs a little bit, right? I call this channel flipper posture, <laughs> right? We hang out, right? Now just notice what you feel. Notice what you feel in your legs when you're sitting like this. Notice if you're on one hip more than the other. Notice stuff for a second, right? Because most of you are sitting crooked. And you think, well, this is only my mind taking in the information. Only my mind's in this room, or my mind matters in this context. Right? Now, just sit up straight and tall for a second. Don't lean against the back of your chair, right? Press down to the inner edge of your heels. Try to make your sits bones feel a little sharper. Don't, like them, don't let them be like butter. Make them like knives. And lift up through your spine and press down through your feet. Now notice the change in awareness in your legs. Notice that you feel your inner thighs a little bit more. I call the inner thighs the forgotten country. <laughs> right? We sit, our spines and the relationship between our, our spine and our femur bones, it's lost. Right? That relationship, if you sit in a wheelchair over time, it's an important dynamic. Technology in wheelchairs is allowing people to slouch back in their chairs, disconnecting themselves from the sensation of gravity moving through their legs. Lean back again. Slouch. Your legs are duller. 
sit up again. CRISPR. So here's the thing that really is going to bake your noodle. I feel the change in gravity too. Alignment, precision, integrate mind and body on some level of sensation that I can't explain. That's for you to explain. I don't care about the explanation. I know after spending years of studying and practicing yoga that I can feel changes in gravity, changes in sensation in my mind-body relationship at a level that's never going to make me walk again. But guess what? It's going to help me transfer. It's going to help me balance. It's going to help me move through my life. There's parts of the mind-body relationship that just aren't in our healthcare system yet. They aren't, in, they aren't in rehabilitation for sure, and that's why I do the work I do. Now, 30 years ago, there's no one to blame for that. Right? The awareness wasn't in our culture yet. It's here now. It's time to change. The question is, how do you make the subtle sensations of the mind-body relationship enter into the process of healing? Now, I'll tell you, I will say that those, that subtle level of sensation in your mind-body relationship is the key to patient engagement. It's the key to the words I've heard today are um, patient compliance and patient adherence. Uh, just can I speak for a patient for a second? If you talk to me about patient compliance, we're done. Our dynamic between us is over. It's, it's really, think about that. Think of what, if you're sitting there and I'm not taking the drugs you want me to take, and you're thinking, he's not complying to my knowledge. What do you think the delivery system of information is? It's our dynamic. If you've made a judgment about me not adhering to what I'm supposed to be doing, I'm isolated. I'm alone again your delivery system for your knowledge has crashed. So I want to read a passage from my book that kind of describes what I experienced. Um, a metaphor that, that I think explains what I experienced in this rehabilitation model of, you know, basically make your arms really strong and drag your paralyzed body through life. I ended up really missing my body 12 years after that, so I started yoga. But Here's the, imagine walking from a well-lit room into a dark one. Imagine the darkness as a visual expression of silence. My rehabilitation, by the way, I forgot to say one thing. Okay, imagine my injury. I want to tell you a little bit about my injury before I read that passage, right? Where if you think about my injury, it's a mind-body injury. It's got a physical cause. It's got psychological and emotional re repercussions, but in fact, it's the one I, the injury I live with every day is a mind-body injury. It's harder for my mind to garner the level of presence in my body necessary for locomotion, for muscular action. That's the injury I live with every day. It's a mind-body injury. If you tickle the bottoms of my feet, I don't feel it. If I tickle the bottoms of your feet, you feel it. I've lost presence in my body. I've lost what I'm telling you I can feel now through yoga this way. So another way to think about my injury is imagine someone took a syringe and injected silence into my mind-body relationship below my point of injury. Now the question of what I've thought of as yoga, and if, by the way, if that's an injection of silence, aging is a slow drip IV. Guess what? Your fate and my fate are the same. Mine happened faster. There's an increasing amount of inward experiential silence coming into your mind-body relationship. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to try to overcome it? Is that a sustainable strategy? So here's, I forgot to introduce silence to you. That's why I had to do it quick. Imagine walking from a well-lit room into a dark one. Imagine the darkness as a visual expression of silence. My rehabilitation made a mistake with the silence by focusing on the absence of light. It too quickly accepted the loss and taught me to willfully strike out against the darkness. It told me to move faster rather than slower, push harder rather than softer. It guided me to compensate for what I could not see. 
Another course of action, however, is patience. Stop moving. Wait for the eyes to adjust. Allow for stillness. And then see what's possible. Although full-fledged vision does not return, usually there's enough light to find one's way across the room. After a while, the moon may come out, sounds may gain texture, and the world might reveal itself once again, only darker. I was convinced to accept a complete loss of light. First, the doctors replaced the flesh and bones of my legs and feet with stories of phantoms and ghosts. Next, the physical therapist guided me to believe that the only meaningful connection to my paralyzed body was through a regenerating spinal cord. Against this backdrop, compensation was offered. My arms and my wheels, fueled by a compensating will, were to carry me through my life. My efforts would aim to prove that the room's darkness didn't matter at all. I would overcome it and become as effective as if the light were still on. But what if I really wanted to be whole? If I wanted to work with the darkness rather than against it? What if the darkness, the silence, is a fundamental part of us? of our consciousness? How do we overcome an essential aspect of what we are? And obviously, what I did is 12 years after, I missed my body, I was a really athletic little kid. And I, and, and I just started listening to my experience of paralysis. Not what it meant in relationship to the world, not what it meant in relationship to my identity, but the actual experience the sensation in, the, in my paralysis. And I started to recognize certain things about it. I started to recognize that when I st align my arm, let's say, and balance it better in my shoulder girdle, if I really listen, right, and I get it aligned up right, I feel energy go down through my legs. That silence is a sensation. Now, here's the problem. I know, especially as I'm talking to people that are very grounded in science, right, um, that this is hard to believe that this sensation exists and all these things, you know, because you're trained a certain way and that's all great because that, that is important, right? So I had some good news happen to me um, this, this June. Um, a, 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 a researcher, the, the associate dean of, um, of the graduate school in psychology at Rutgers heard about my purported sensation in my yoga poses and said, you know, I think I, I know how that's happening. So he's got a theory of the vagus nerve he published a paper not too long ago about it. And he put my head in a functional MRI. And he had me do some, some, some basic yoga poses and then came and grabbed my ankles. And, then, and what happened was my sensory cortex exactly mapped to my ankles, lit like a really bright light. Way light, really bright. And then they touched my bladder and it lit again. And unfortunately for him, in his theory, it doesn't look like it's coming through the vagus nerve. He has no idea right? But the big thing is that it was spilling over to my motor cortex too. That my brain is actually getting information from this level of sensation that is affecting its input for balance, for proprioception, for movement, for all the things that I need to transfer and move through my life. So this sensation, this subtle level of sensation is, is hopefully as, of course now he wants to do more tests, Got to do more analysis, and then we got to feel, feel, figure out the big thing is if I can, if I can, um, if it's in true in my students, if it's replicable, right? And I already know it is. I already knew this sensation was real because I knew from my own experience. I already knew that. I already know it's teachable. I've been doing it for 12 years. But there's a certain story that's needed to get attention, to be able to move the innovation, to get some smarter people than me to start thinking about how it goes. So. I know this sensation is real. We know how to teach it. My nonprofit knows how to teach it. We develop stuff for the end user, me. But we also um, train um, people in healthcare, kind of what we're talking about. And, we've, and what we've focused on is something really simple. The best way to get mind body awareness to me, the end user, by the time I leave the healthcare system, is to make sure I'm not told limiting, limited stories about my mind body relationship by the power at hand as I wake up from a traumatic experience, right? So that, like, you know, instead of saying we know exactly what that is, you say, well, you know, there's parts of the mind-body relationship we don't quite understand. You're like a blind person who has to develop other senses. There's a way for you to feel your whole body, but we're not, and here's how you gotta, this is something you have to go on through the rest of your life. Because one thing I'll tell you is a disability is a lifetime issue. It's a relentless 
spiritual teacher. That's what disability is. Right? You'll, you'll come to disability more at the end of your life, most likely. Right? And it will be a spiritual teacher then too. So that, was a, you know, so that needs to happen. But we also just started thinking, the only way to really teach mind-body awareness is through relationship. And so there's a program going at the Courage Center um, where I've been training um, rehabilitation professionals. And this week I start with the nursing staff. We've been doing it for 18 months now. And we got phenomenal results by teaching them mind body way to focus on, on the staff because getting consent on patients is really hard to do. Right? So we're focusing on staff and we've had f fantastic results where as they, we teach them mind body techniques, they start having drops in stress, improvements in quality of life, better job commitment, better, better um, commitment to their profession. And they're using mind body techniques in 61 to 80% of all their interactions with clients. That's unheard of. It's because we're not changing what they're doing. We're not introducing something that conflicts with their already existing way of practicing. We're affecting how they're doing it. We're affecting how, not what. So it integrates right in. It doesn't increase their time for billing. It doesn't do any of that. Mind-body awareness is a low-hanging fruit. We can, this can go into our healthcare system sooner and better. And what's great about the that you know, hopefully we'll, they'll be experiencing less job turnover, all the things that, that are, help um, plague healthcare systems, right? And, and there's a business argument to invest in the mind-body awareness of the staff, right? So here's an innovation, a low-hanging technology, a disruptive technology maybe, that you all need in this room. Everyone, you guys have a new health center I know, you guys need to be more connected to your body. I know you do. I, everyone does. It's the best home your mind will ever have. These are simple truths where I've been listening today and fascinated by, by the, the amount of technology and the amount of thought and all the complicated answers. And you know what? The way that mind-body awareness, mind-body awareness needs to enter the healthcare practice. And we've got to find a way to make it be cost-effective, save somebody money, right? but it is what allows Kevin to feel his whole body again. It allows his outcome over the long term to change. This isn't that hard, but you know what it means? It means you have to confront yourself. You've got to practice mind-body awareness. You've got to learn to give without sacrificing. You've got to learn to, to, to have compassionate boundaries. You need your body for all that. So at the end, if you take nothing else out of what I said, if you're at, if you're at the, at, if you come to the conference tomorrow, would you at least take your shoes off all day? <laughs> would you wiggle your toes once in a while? Just let the dogs bark. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>